So um, again, um, thanks for coming. It wasn't that a fantastic uh, uh, performance? Thank you. Um, even uh, 25 uh, years later, and it's also beautiful to see just the the streaming of the end of the videotape, right? These kind of cosmic rays that end. Uh, and that's all what we see, little specks of lights and sounds. But um, maybe just let's go directly to Gary. What, what comes to your mind when you see this? And you said you never saw the video. I, I, never, I never, I don't think, any, well, I don't think anybody saw it, or very few people saw it. It was just, a rec they just made it to have a record of it. Um, what I kept thinking is that you could shoot it on an iPhone now, and it would be that it would be a million times clearer than. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it has its own aesthetic. One of the best things that I've that, it, that I continue to show people, even though it, it's is um, something that Vincent Fremont shot for Andy Warhol in 1974 with. Charles Rydell and Bridget Berlin called to fight, and it was just an improvisation. And I mean, it was shot in a very early porta pack. And when you see it now, you can see that when the camera pans, if it passes across a light source, then this big streak just goes. I I I don't know. I would have still. Well, I I don't know. I I would have. It would be nice to see it enhanced, maybe. Um, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but um, I, I like I, I like the technology we have now a lot better than what we had then. So oh, thanks, Greg. Tell us, uh, t tell us a bit about uh, the, how did it all get together? How did it? What was the story of it? Uh, well. Jack Smith died, and uh, Ron was uh, something a little more than an acquaintance, not really a close friend, but enough to have visited Jack a few times and, and gone to some of his performances. And uh, as he said, you know, it was part of this whole world, but a very small world of uh, avant-garde theater makers at the time. And uh, so he wanted, but Jack, you know, at that time was almost completely unknown. I mean, almost forgotten, as he talks about in his work. I mean, no, they, no, if you said Jack Smith to even theater people, they, very few people knew who he was. So Ron wanted to do something to, uh, you know, m memorialize him. So... Uh, he talked to uh, Penny Arcade, who was the executor of the Jack Smith estate, and it came up with, with that tape, What's Underground About Marshmallows. And as Ron said, you know, Jack Smith's performances could be up to nine hours. So uh, the first thing was what he said. He went to Amsterdam. He was uh, performing with the Wooster Group, and so on his off hours, he shot the, took those slides. And then he came back here, and uh, I think the first thing was we went to the Walker Art Center. They, uh, you know, brought us there to work on it. And so he performed the uh, Jack Smith part. At that time, it was in a big boat. We constructed this boat, like a big rowboat. And uh, like in one of the movies, I think it's Alibaba, isn't it? Where he goes across the Red Sea or something. Anyway, it was all this boat and there was all this treasure and all the jewels and everything. And all these chests of jewels. And uh, so we did that. And, uh, but it was, you know, it, I think it was about an hour then. And uh, Ron was like, it's, it's not enough. You know, it needs a companion piece. So then we came up with the idea of Roy Cohn. I had been reading all this stuff about Roy Cohn. And as opposed to Jack, we wanted to do something that was opposite of Jack. 
Roy Cohn was very well known. He was, you know, he's like Donald Trump now. And as you probably know, he was Donald Trump's mentor. He was on uh, at the Post. He went out with Barbara Walters all the time. I mean, he was a big New York person. And he was very good friends with Cardinal Spellman and, you know, like all, Kitty, all the big people. And uh, so anyway, it came up with the idea of, of uh, Roy Cohn. And then we, I happened to read in, in this biography of him about how he had made that speech he talks about. But there was, we tried to find it. Marianne Weems was our dramaturg, and we tried to find some record, but we couldn't. So then I thought of Gary, because I admired Gary's writing so much, and um, I wanted to do something that was very political. Because Jack was like non, totally non-political. He never mentioned anything political. It was like he wasn't even living in our <laughs> present world. <laughs> he really was living in this kind of uh, Hollywood, you know, exotica fantasy world. So, um, so we st then Gary started, uh, I told him the idea, like what would the speech might have been like, but as a kind of, you know, satire. And, uh, and Gary wrote that, and uh, then the, you know, I wanted it to match in the time, roughly. So we did a lot of editing. You know, Gary's speech was originally much longer. But, um, we went to Los Angeles to the uh, uh, MOCA, Museum of Contemporary Art, and we did it there, a kind of work in progress. Also, people couldn't, I kept saying, you know, this is a theater, but everyone kept thinking, oh, it's, you know, it's not like a regular play, so they would put it in these like art spaces. So anyway, it was there at MOCA, and uh, Uh, when we were at MOCA, uh, Julie Lazar, who was the programmer there, uh, hired some people and they did, a, a, they taped Roy Cohn part, just Roy Cohn, because Jack Smith wouldn't, just by the audio, wouldn't be <laughs> enough. So, yeah, and I have copies of that, and I forget who, there were some other artists too, but it was like a, they had like a radio program. So anyway, we did it there, and then I think that was it. And then we did it here at the Performing Garage. And then subsequent to this, at the Performing Garage, we went on tour to Europe, and we did it in uh, Amsterdam, in uh, Brussels, in Berlin, in London. I think that was it. And then, uh, less than two years later, uh, well, Ron always wanted a film to be made of it. The
this Jack Smith was never recorded. What am I saying, Jack Smith? Roy Cohn. Yeah, they did the Roy Cohn. And there was. An and then they sped Jack. it up. Yeah. Which so then it, it was just like. Ugh. But I, yeah, I just remember getting. They were like, "Oh, it can't be that long. Can it won't be thirty minutes." And I was like, "And they were like, well, I don't want to cut it." And so then they were like, "Well, we'll just make it faster." And <laughs> well, I don't know, but the Roy Cohn part of this seemed to me kind of sped up, like part of it. This? Yeah. No, this is the real performance. It, yeah. You know, they didn't. But it do anything. seemed. Like, I don't know. It it seemed like it was. I couldn't understand. Yeah, no, he uh, went really fast. Yeah. That the sound's not so great on this. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. In the theater, I think you could understand it. Yes, you could, but... Um, 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 Alisa, I think it's also, of course, a, a play of its time, of the AIDS crisis, of the end, perhaps, also, of something that happened in New York. But So w what do you think that fits all in, and how do you see the work? Wow. Um, that's a big question. I mean, first I just have to say how emotional it is to see Ron, you know? I just, I just need to say that. I mean, it's just really intense and beautiful and heartbreaking, and um, as the piece was at the time. Uh, so this was, what year was, was this? 90 92. So by then, you know, we're already into, um, a kind of second phase of theater pieces dealing with AIDS. Um, this is when I wish David Roman was here because he's really an expert on the <coughs> theater about AIDS. I mean, I miss him for other reasons too. Um, so I guess, you know, uh, to make a really, um, to paint it with a very broad brush, because I'd say like early in the epidemic we had, um, or the things that were most visible were pretty straightforward narrative uh, dramas, like um, I guess The Normal Heart was the first major one, sort of agitproppy, uh, powerful piece of work by Larry Kramer. Um, and, as and as is, William Hoffman's play, uh, realistic drama um, about uh, a, a man and his partner dealing with one of them dying. Um, and by this time, 92, I mean, it's an interesting moment. I mean, for one thing, there, you know, Roy Cohn was all over in a way. I mean, there was that um, Citizen Cohn, is that what it was called? Mm -hmm. You know, that had just come out, and Angels in America came out around the same time. Exactly um, the same time. You know, with the Roy Cohn character. Um, and, and I guess the other things that were happening around that time, um, Ron Athey's work, um, performance work dealing, you know, with AIDS in a very different kind of way. Um, Hot Keys had started around then, Jeff Weiss's um, great serial drama. Um, that was indirectly, but unmistakably dealing with AIDS in um, uh, this incredible combination of, of uh, cheeriness and um, mean-spiritedness. <laughs> was kind of great. But I think this piece maybe commenting on that through these other characters. But it's interesting nope. that he didn't want to be interviewed or made into, you know, that, that he didn't want to put himself forward in that particular way. Right, and I way. just want to say that we, we went to see all those plays. Uh -huh. And as you can imagine, probably Ron wasn't too fond of them and didn't want to make any kind of normal play about, you know, AIDS. It, that's not what he was interested in. So it, it was in some ways a reaction, uh, just like the work of the Wooster Group and many other yeah. people is in some ways a reaction against the regular commercial theater that was yeah. and is all around us. And yet, I wonder, maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, about acting. Um, when I think, I mean, you know, Ron didn't work only with the Wooster Group. Um, he worked with Mebu Mines and, and other projects. Um, but I th think that 
the nature of the performance in Roy Cohn, Jack Smith, is very different from the nature of the kinds of ways he would be on stage in the Worcester group. Yeah, it was different. And, um, you know, that was a process. To, uh, he, one of the things I remember, it, he didn't want to have any accents. He, he was very, like, insistent, I don't want to imitate them. And at a certain point, I said, well, you just have to have the Bronx accent. You just have to for Roy Cohn. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense if you don't. And so, of course, he, I think, gives a brilliant, mm. um, I mean, he's not, doesn't, as he said, he's not sound exactly like Roy Cohn, but the, the, the interior, the, um, what I noticed this time more than sometimes other, um, I've only seen it one other time since 25 years ago. Uh, and what I'm so impressed by, I'm an actor myself and, and in rehearsal right now, so I could use some of this, is um, his ability to instantly change from something really funny and technically brilliantly timed and everything to something deeply tragic mm. and still and interior. And, but without, you know, pointing at it or, you know, how actors can be <laughs> without showing off, really, except it is a kind of even more showing off yeah. because it's just so virtuosic. Well, that's one of the things that's so great about the contrast in the piece. Right, and then when you see that, you're like, I can't even believe it's the same person. Yeah. I mean... But also that the, it is a very interior, you know, the Roy Cohn is very interior, and maybe that's the word I was looking for in contrast to other work of, of Ron's that I saw over many years. And then, you know, and, and, and then to contrast that with um, the onion scene, um, which is a masterpiece just in and of itself, those, those three minutes, whatever they are. Of, um, well, the other thing is that very Wooster group, he's, you know, he's actually right. listening right. to an edited tape of Jack Smith. And if you listen very closely at the very end of the piece, you hear Jack Smith's voice. And so for that part, he was, because he wanted to do this homage to Jack, he very consciously tried to sound exactly like what was in his ear, Jack's real voice. And, and because he had seen his performances, his performance style was even though it wasn't six hours long, I think it gave a good impression. Like, you're like, what is, you know. It, it, it such a different attitude about time on the stage and what an actor can and can't do and, and all that stuff, which he just breaks every rule there ever it was. And, uh, and I think he captured that so well by just, you know, it would drive me crazy, but I would just be like, he's like, no, you know, we have to wait. We have to, you know, and I was like, well, what? are we waiting for? <laughs> but my favorite is like about when he says, that was in the early 60s. And then you can just, see, he doesn't do anything, but you can just see like the whole early 60s. It's like, <laughs> all right, and then he comes back and, and he's so sad. It's like, oh, it's not the early 60s anymore. <laughs> Could you say but, something about, sorry, no, no, about uh, Gary, the, the pauses um, in Roy Cohn, those two, because I'm just thinking of yeah. what you said about the time and the tempo. Well, in, in you Jack know, Smith. a speech is like, I, I was just like enough already with, you know, Roy and, I mean, it's great, but, you know, there was, plus just practically for the actor, it was very tiring because it's so intense. And so I made those pauses and I remember say, he was like, well, what am I going to do in the pause? And I said, don't do anything. And I used the, the image of uh, Greta Garbo at the end of uh, Queen Christina, where she's just looking. And I had read this, I always read biographies. I read this biography of her. And the director, Ruben Lamillions, she asked the same question, well, what do I do? And he said, don't do anything, just look. So that's what he did. And then I said, well, look at the audience. So when he's looking out, he's looking right at the audience. And it also gave him a chance to sort of, you know, compose himself and get ready. Because it was, as you can imagine, quite a workout, especially for someone who's ill. Yeah. I think when I saw the Berlin performance at the Hebel, he was no longer as 
strong, I think, as, right. a, as a performer. No. But a question to, to to Gary: Did you work with Ron on the text? Was it a, or did you just deliver it, or it was a longer? How did it work <coughs> out to get your um, your your text right? Um, we we actually got a lot of um, kinescopes or old. Um, we tried to get like documents yeah. of. Uh, of um, interviews with appearances him. and interviews so that I could get Roy Cohn's vocabulary down and also a little bit the rhythms that he spoke in. And he had also, um, there was like f three or four books that he had ostensibly written or had written for him. Um, so, you know, we all read all of that and um, no, I mean, I made it up, and I got really pissed off when the New York Times reviewed the play and said I had made, like, a a collage of things that Roy Cohn had said. He'd never said anything that was in that speech. Cohn actually was quite, I mean, he was smart, and he could, in that really mean way, he could be really funny, and, and he, he was also very skilled at um, presenting himself in public, so like in all these interviews, he would say funny things, and, and he did talk just like, I mean, he talked really fast, yeah. and he would mention, dr name drop constantly, and you know, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was fun to do, but I'm sure that's because he was dead. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, the, which would not be the case if you were trying to do something with Donald Trump. Right. Um, but well, the good thing uh, he was dead, or he would have sued you. Uh, oh yeah, no, he he would sue you for anything. Yeah, I and think that, in that, and that's where Trump learned yeah. everything was from I him, basically. In the this latest Vanity Fair portrait of Roy Cohn, they claimed for for a long time they spoke daily, Trump and Cohn. And it was one of uh, the, his. He was his. He really was his mentor, Mephistopheles. In a, in a way, no, he was. Roy Cohn told him, re, you know, I mean, he Roy Cohn connected him with all these mafia people, for one thing. Um, uh, uh, you know, that's that's how all the Trump buildings got built. And um, but he, but he taught him like, don't ever apologize for anything and don't ever back down. Somebody down. attacks you, you go back twice as hard. And that's what Roy Cohn did. I mean, he was one of the originators of the frivolous lawsuit I, that could bankrupt somebody that he was, you know, pulled into litigation that was frivolous, essentially, and without foundation, but would bankrupt the people that he went after. I mean, and, and um, we just live in the debris of Roy Cohn, and that weasel in the White House. Um, Stephen Miller, I think, was the other protege of Roy Cohn. Oh, no, Roger Stone. Oh, yeah, Roger Stone. Stone. Yeah. But that weasel um, looks just like him. <laughs> Stephen Miller looks exactly like Roy Cohn. He's yeah, like yeah. he was cloned from him. Um, I just want to uh, recognize Pedro Juan Rosado, Chico. Maybe put some light on the audience, uh, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> is there anyone else in this room who was involved in the original production? No? Anyway, um, but there are um, several people here, many people probably, who also worked with Ron. Um, and we wanted to um, open it up uh, 
Uh, well, Lee Brewer is here. He directed Ron in um, Lear. Do you want to say something, Lee? Have anything to contribute? So yeah, we have a microphone. We have we a microphone not coming. Only we hear better, but we also record it. But yes, yeah, so it could be questions, comments. <laughs> uh, it was a great privilege to work with Ron in Lear, and I had an amazing cast, including our dear friend over here. Uh, take a wave. Lola Pashalinsky. Who played Ken and sitting next to Alisa, who was the dramaturg, and uh, Karen Evans Kendall, Ruth Malachek, uh and Greg, who was up there. Who was who the fool. Who was took amazing. Obi as the fool. Uh, but um, I must say, I really wanted a Mississippi accent, and Ron was the only one that gave me a perfect one. He played Regan. And he was just brilliant, you know. Bill Raymond played Goneril. And uh, who else? Yeah, Izzy Monk. Izzy, Isabel Monk played? Gloucester. <sighs> Gloucester. Gloucester. <laughs> it's a long time ago. <laughs> but it was, uh, and uh, Pauline Oliveras did the music. So it was quite an exciting group of people to work with. Uh, but Ron was one of the stars. And it was just, I just want to pay homage a little bit. Uh, this was a great performance that I saw tonight. I never saw the complete tape. I saw a little bit of it over at Greg's at one time. But this was one of the greatest performances I've seen. And I've seen maybe, yeah, it ranks with the top two or three performances that I've seen. I think it's just a great piece of work. and. Uh, from a directorial point of view, I think that Ron was brilliant in this piece. Absolutely brilliant. Believed everything. It was absolutely hilarious, and it was totally tragic. And it was a beautiful combination. Uh, he was a great actor, and it was a great loss. So I just want to say, bless you, Ron Lauder. Um, anybody? Uh, Jill? Can you hand that mic to Jill Godbillo? Thank you. Just briefly, Greg, you can answer this. I once read somewhere that Ron said that when he was growing up and realizing he was gay, there were only two public gay figures, two, two gays that he knew of. And one was Roy Cohn and the other was Jack Smith. Is that uh, just wonderful uh, legend? Or uh, two ways to be gay, I think. Well, I, uh, that um, I don't think that's true, okay. but. <laughs> Such a uh, good story. I know when Ron uh, moved to New York, he immediately contacted um, the Gay Liberation Front. So yeah. he, the, those were gay people. So is it, <laughs> is it, is it true that, that he mixed in some of Jack Smith's ashes into his eyeshadow? Yes, that's true. That's true. I just want to say one other thing. Yeah, not into the glitter. The glitter. Yeah. And not the uh, eyeshadow. That Ron had two brilliant texts to perform, and he learned to perform texts with the Worcester Group and other work he did. But those, in, and they come from two different sources, and they were perfect, but they, somebody wrote that Jack Smith, that Roy Cohn, and Jack Smith wrote that other text, and every actor should have texts like that to work with. You know. Mind we give you the microphone? No, we, we, are we have a so microphone we have coming. A microphone. One second. It's going to come right away. Lola Pashalinsky. Thank you. This is, this is um, just sort of on this, it's a side thing, just for point of information. I, uh, wasn't it true that, uh, that um, Ron uh, played Roy Cohn in the London production, and early, the first London production of um, Angels in America. No. no. Am no. I imagining it? I rem I, there was yeah, a big there, there was interview, were, um, in the interview in the Times. There was an interview in the Times. Yeah, there was a double interview in the yeah, Times right. with yes. uh, Ron Vauder and Ron Liebman. Right. Which I, they invited, I went to the thing. <laughs> it was so crazy because right. Ron Liebman like we were talking about, is a product, I guess he's dead now, uh, was a product of, uh, you know, total commercial yeah. theater and was doing, you know, 
his version, so they asked them to speak about that. And I think yes. Ron Liebman had done it in London, London yes. before he was asked to do it here. Right. And just uh, on a side note, uh, it's coming back to, to Broadway being with, revived with uh, the famous Nathan. gay actor Nathan Lane. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I <laughs> must, oh, yeah, and, uh, must and the innocent suffer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, uh, and the actor who played Roy Cohn in Citizen Cohn has just been accused of sexual harassment. Oh, um, yeah. I, 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 I love yeah. that you have him out, Ed Koch. That's, that's, that's <laughs> a great moment in the script. <laughs> I'm glad you clarified that for me. Oh, but no, also... They did, they did ask Ron, after this, uh, they asked him to play the engineer in Miss Saigon. So we went to... They gave us the tickets, the fabulous tickets to Miss Saigon, and then Ron wanted to leave during the first act. <laughs> and I said, you can't leave. They gave you these tickets. You know, you have to at least sit through it. So, to, to replace Jonathan Price, you know, the original person. Uh, um, LSD, uh, just the high points. I remember he was in the audience one night. I'm such a star fucker, really. <laughs> but uh, um, I remember that. And then they, you and Jonathan and uh, Ron went out to dinner after. And it just so happened that I and a party of other people went out to dinner at the same place. Yeah, no, it was a great success. It was, it was, I think partially because it was so different than Ron's other work that it attracted all, you know, a, a, this old audience, but also a new audience, too. Um, so, yeah, that was very exciting. I think, you know, one thing we didn't talk about was that it's, uh, you know, and maybe this is part of why, I mean, people came to it because it was great and word got out and that's why people came. But I think also part of it is that it, it's, it's a piece about, um, among other things, homophobia before AIDS. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's very much of its moment and still very timely, unfortunately, um, but but neither of the people he's representing, even though both of them died of AIDS, are, are in a moment, you know, they're, they're represented at an earlier time. And um, what we come to understand about them has to do with the, uh, and, and you use that disease imagery in the, in the Roy Cohn text toward the end of homosexuality itself as a virus. And, um, and it just sort of speaks to the, that you know, poison of, that that social poison. Well, the with the um, the parts that you're you're talking about, there. I put them in because the reaction to the to the epidemic initially was very much the same as the reaction to the gay rights right. bill, and it was couched in the same kind of language of the contagion, um, infection, disease. Uh, something you can catch. Um, uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions, comments. Um, this is really a question for Greg because I think you'll remember about this thing that I can't quite remember. Um, there was a really beautiful um, sort of behind the scenes making of documentary about the tour of this show in oh, Europe yeah. that that German woman made. Gaya Kaltengener. And um, sometime, every, once a year, um, the Siegel Center has a festival of um, theater on film and video. And that was really never released beyond maybe a little festival circuit. But if someone could dig up a copy of that. I have a copy. Um, it's yeah, that uh, fa uh, this woman. Uh, it, uh, it's about German documentary yeah. filmmaker Gea Kaltegener, who unfortunately died some years ago. Um, she just idolized Ron, and and she uh, 
you know, she was European and she made these Europe, small European films. And so she said, oh, can I just follow you around on the European tour and, and make this film? So she did. It's called Free Fall. And it's a beautiful, it's, she, she didn't shoot any of the performance. She only shot, like, backstage, in the hotel. And rehearsals. Yeah, like, not, no real, I think, like, five seconds. We, someone opens a door and you see him on stage. But it, it wasn't about that. So, um, that's yeah, that's a good idea because... It gives a, yeah, it, as you were saying, it was later, and he was, uh, that was a very difficult tour um, for him and everyone involved, and uh, so there's a lot of him, like, lying in bed in the hotel room, and she's, she asks all these very simple questions, and he talks because he knew, like, this was this kind of t last testament. So, yeah, I'll look for that. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Maybe, uh, John, if you... Uh Want to make a comment and then you, John Jeff, you, John. Do you want to, John? John uh, Jezrin, uh, after we did this um, show, uh, uh, we did, well, there were two more projects that happened. I'll, I'll tell you about the last one first. The last one was, uh, oh no, there were three. Uh, <laughs> After this, uh, we decided, oh, we'll do a play where, um, you know, I directed Ron, he'll direct me. So uh, we did this play that Lola was involved in called Queer and Alone, based on a novel by James Cormany. My name is... Uh, oh, Jim Straw, sorry. Uh, my name is Desmond Farquhar, <laughs> and that is my real name. I just hate it when people change their names all the time, don't you? That was the opening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we did that at the kitchen. Uh, then uh, we did this play, uh, well, Ron did this play, um, Philoctetes. It was uh, three different versions, correct me if I'm wrong, John, wrong, John but it was, I think, Sophocles, uh, Andre Gide, and then Ron commissioned um, John Jezrin to write the third adaptation of the ancient myth of Philoctetes who gets bitten by a snake and is exiled to an island where he's tormented. So, John, can you talk about that experience? Just a little bit, but uh, yeah, I, I did want to just say that um, it is um, interesting, uh, I think Jill was saying the, this kind of connection between um, the writer and the actor, so um, that it is kind of important that, uh, you know, Ron was able to pull this stuff out of the writers. Uh, he, he seemed to uh, have some kind of, you know, radar of what he wanted to get, and, um, uh, and so he was able to persuade, you know, me to write this. this uh, I did not want to write a Greek anything <laughs> at that point. Um, and... Uh, and it basically, it was kind of, he kind of said, well, you know, it doesn't have to really be, you know, a Greek, just write a play and we'll call it Philoctetes kind of idea. <laughs> so um, that it was that kind of a way of, of pulling um, material, uh, not by dictating it to me or anything like that, but he, you know, there's a great connection between, you know, actors and writers that people don't talk about. Uh, and in a way, they don't even talk about it. It's just kind of this osmosis and a connection in uh, um, what one thinks the other one might be able to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, this was a completely, uh, you know, idea completely came out, to me, completely came out of the blue. And then I thought, oh, my God, now Gary Indiana's written this great thing, uh, and I have to write a Greek play. <laughs> so uh, what am I going to do? So anyway, it was, it, it, I just think it's important to remember there's this very interesting connection. So that's kind of how you know, my play came about. And also, it also had to be done very, very uh, quickly. I, there was a kind of a time limit, which I think Ron was very honest about. He said, you know, uh, this is it. Who knows? 
Uh, so I had to sort of work on it uh, quickly and sort of under a cloud and um, so, but anyway, so that's kind of how that uh, happened. And he did, I think he had a great connection to, to I mean, you can say, to language uh, that um, uh, it was important. Uh, and I think, yeah, some of it did come out of his work at the Worcester Group. He certainly had a lot of great language. But I, I also think, to his credit, he, he um, you know, uh, keeps the writer on their toes, <laughs> you know. It cannot be less than, you know, he can do for you. So um, I was, you know, thrilled with, with that. So um, anyway, yeah, that's uh, one John, more person. I, I just want to say something that I, okay. I'm, I just want to ask John something, actually, because um, I, th I was thinking the whole time we were watching this that we were under this, we were all operating under the strangest constraints and and weirdness because we didn't rush developing Roy Cohn. We didn't. I and we knew that Ron could die any time. And it was one of the stranger things was that the project ha we had such con perfectionistic wishes for it that we refused to you know, I, I mean, it took a year to develop it, and during that year, as I think, when, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, in the parlance of the time, that Ron Ciro, I mean, he went from being HIV positive. Well, to it was officially diagnosed. Yeah, um, I think, actually, afterwards the performances started. No, no, before. Before, but maybe but not the, publicly. But it was a weird. It was it was just very strange. Yeah. No. It was it was. Um, well, that was the thing. I mean, it wasn't just us. There were l many many people in the theater who were you know designers, all all kinds of people, who were like, well, I want to work. I mean, I'm sick, but I want to work. So like, you would go to work, and then like, oh, that person, you know, and then the next day you'd be like, oh, that person died. And you're like, what? But then after a while, it became, I mean, you know, as, you know, there'd be like 50 people you knew who died, or 100 people you knew who died. And then every day you'd read about people and you'd go, oh, Michael Bennett, oh, yeah. And so, yeah, so I mean, I'm but sure no, but a lot I, of... No, but in this case, if the actor had died, there wouldn't have been any play. Right. So... This was, this was before... No, it never opened. That's what I mean. It, they did a, a couple of performances, and then he couldn't do it. So after that, we uh, took a train. To, we got a, a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to go to, what's it called? Bellagio in Lake Como. And we worked on the final thing we ever worked on, which was called Dark Victory, which was included all these parts of novels like Brothers Karamazov and Uncle Tom's Cabin and all these scenes where a dying person, two scenes, it was for me and Ron, as I, we said, you directed me, I directed you, now we'll work together and Susan Sontag was the director and it was all these two scenes and we alternated between the person who's dying and the, per and the caretaker person. But when we got to Bellagio, it, that was it. He couldn't do anymore and had to go to in the hospital and then he just wanted to go back to New York so we got on the plane and he died on the plane going back to New York. Yeah, I was thinking that might be a good good moment to go over. It's already yep. this past. I night. know. What? And, uh, yes. I have one question. Oh, where was Ron from and what is his background? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I don't know if she's here. There's a, new, a biography coming out of oh, him wow. by this author named Teresa. S oh, hi. So maybe you should ask her. But OK, I think that's enough. And uh, we're going to have a short reception now. Yeah, again, thank you, thank uh, you. Uh, um, for coming. And um, thank you for um, being here. And um, thank you. We're going to have a reception. Thank you.